Bonsoir, mesdames et messieurs. Je suis le directeur de programme pour la Société littéraire St. James. Au nom de notre président, Kevin Journal, je vous souhaite la bienvenue et j'espère que vous allez passer une soirée très agréable. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Samuel Broman and I am the Director of Programs for the St. James Literary Society. In the name of our president, I welcome you and a special welcome to our distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Peter Nugas. There are two ladies in the audience this evening that I would like to bring to your attention. Dr. Marion Dove, who is the chair of family medicine at McGill, and Dr. Isabel Vidal, uh, also of the same department. Both ladies will be participating in tonight's program a little bit later on. Before we get to the main event, I would like to spend a minute or two in and sharing some information about the St. James Literary Society. Our group was founded in 1898. We're a nonprofit organization. Our motto is Permite Lucem, which means let there be light. Our mandate is to provide a forum for the free exchange of ideas between the guest speaker and the audience on such a varied set of topics as UFOs, um, war, uh, politics, uh, medicine, dentistry, religion, um, education, uh, wine tasting, and so on. Uh, so you can see that we take a rather extended view of the word literary. Over the years, we have been honored by the presence of many illustrious guest speakers. I'm thinking of people like Wilder Penfield, Phil Gold, F. Cyril James, Suzanne Fortier, Heather Monroe Bloom, Harold Bergman, Marion Dove, um, Hugh Siegel from Ottawa, the senator, and so on and so on. I invite you to visit our website at stjamesliterarysociety.com. And now a brief bio of the next speaker, Dr. Mark Yaffe. Dr. Yaffe is a McGill professor of family medicine for the last 41 years. Based at St. Mary's Hospital, he has been heavily involved in patient care, clinical research, teaching, and administration. He was the person who conceptualized the idea of this memorial lecture. And in that context, he will say a few words about its initial benefactor, Dr. Hirsch Rosenfeld. Dr. Yaffe. Thank you, Mr. Broman. Bonsoir tout le monde, good evening. I don't know whether I'm projecting or not. I'm not getting the feedback. Mr. Broman, can you see me and hear me? You're doing great. Thank you, okay. I'd like to take a few moments to share with you a little bit about the late Dr. Hirsch Rosenfeld a Montreal family physician who helped make this lectureship a reality. When Dr. Rosenfeld was nearing retirement, I approached him about the idea of creating this lectureship that would help advance the understanding of what family medicine was about and which would describe the broad range of interests and activities of many family physicians. The outcome of the proposal was ambitious 
Uh, there was to be a series of presentations that would be of interest to the general population, but as well of interest to healthcare trainees and to active practitioners. Dr. Rosenfeld's response to the proposal was rapid, positive, and characteristically enthusiastic. He had always been dedicated to his patients, having begun his practice prior to the era of Medicare, when patients had to directly pay their physicians for the services given. He was, however, sensitive to the possible negative consequences of payment, and there were patients who received care from him gratis. This approach extended to him founding and later directing the Doctors' Hospital in Montreal, which was created to assist those who could not afford health care prior to the era of universal health coverage. Many years ago, one of Dr. Rosenfeld's nephews told me that a long-standing philosophy of his uncle was, quote, what can life get out of me, unquote. From where did such a credo arise? Dr. Rosenfeld was the product of many formative experiences. He did his undergraduate university study at McGill, and he hoped to pursue medical studies also at McGill. However, this was a sad era of religious admission quotas, and as a Jewish applicant, he was turned down. He was fortunate, though, to end up studying medicine in Strasbourg in France. And on the completion of this training, he hoped to return to Montreal and practice. He lacked, however, the necessary funds to return to Montreal in order to write his medical licensing examinations. He was successful, however, in trying to earn money by getting a job as a cabin steward on a Canadian Pacific passenger ship that traveled between Southampton in England and Montreal. This was obviously fortuitous, but not straightforward. As an employee of the ship, he was not permitted to disembark when it arrived in Montreal. And as a consequence, he simply shuttled back and forth between these two cities for a number of voyages. On one eventful Atlantic crossing, he was summoned to the cabin of the ship's captain and informed that henceforth he would no longer be their employee and that he was to be a guest of the steamship line. And as such, when they arrived in Montreal, he would be permitted to disembark. As I understood this story, there was no clear explanation given to Dr. Rosenfeld at this time as to what the origins uh, of this bequest were. However, years later, a patient consulting Dr. Rosenfeld in his office asked if he had been the Rosenfeld who had once worked for Canadian Pacific. It turned out this man had been the secretary to the president of the steamship line, later known as Sir Edward Beatty. And as the story then unfolded, Sir Edward had received a very compelling letter about Hirsch from a Montreal lawyer, in actuality, Hirsch's brother. For unknown reasons, this intervention was unknown to Dr. Rosenfeld until that particular office visit. Dr. Rosenfeld took on many challenges during his lifetime, and in particular, his fight for Montreal Jewish physicians to be granted hospital privileges at a time when denial was nothing more than anti-Semitism. Over the years, he and his wife, Devorah, supported the education of needy students and along with the endowment of scholarships and bursaries in a number of countries. At McGill, there exists today such a Rosenfeld endowment that commemorates the generosity of Sir Edward Beatty. The Rosenfelds did not have children of their own, but their affection and their giving to children was great. In the mid-1950s, the annual Montreal Santa Claus Parade was a major occurrence in late November, and families would stand out in the cold for two to three hours as the parade inched up Park Avenue, passing the building where Dr. Rosenfeld had his office. He took pity on cold spectators and yearly would open his office to kids from varying and different backgrounds who, they could, who could watch the parade from the warmth of his office. I, along with my own family, were beneficiaries of this kindness. Thank you for joining us this evening for the Rosenfeld Lecture. Thank you, Dr. Yaffe. And now Dr. Marion Dove will introduce our guest speaker. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Brauman, and thank you, Dr. Yaffe. I'm Dr. Marion Dove. I'm the chair of the Department of Family Medicine at McGill University, and I am thrilled to see such a large number of you here tonight, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to the Dr. Hirsch Rosenfeld Annual Distinguished Public Lecture in Family Medicine. I think that we are probably setting a record for attendance at this event because I see over 120 people online. And this is also a historic night because it is our first virtual event in this public lecture series. Our presenter today, Dr. Peter Nugis, is an associate professor at the Institute for Health Sciences Education in the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences at McGill University. And he is the co-director of the McGill University Practice-Based Research Network in the Department of Family Medicine. As you may know, the PBRN is a support structure for practicing clinicians to conduct research on clinical and organizational questions central to primary health care. This pandemic has given us so many new questions to ponder in primary care and has actually really been a change in paradigm as it's forced us to throw away all our old notions of how things have been done in medicine. Family physicians have been of the utmost importance during the pandemic and have responded to calls to work in emergency rooms, in long-term care facilities, and a variety of other practice settings. Emergency rooms in particular are often thought of as chaotic places, but COVID-19 has required health professionals to change how they provide emergency care services completely. Some patients have unfortunately delayed care for new and concerning symptoms. People have reported seeking treatment at other locations or choosing to avoid seeking care altogether. So Dr. Nugis will be speaking to the flexibility, creativity, and fortitude of so many healthcare professionals and trainees who adapted a fragmented system for the sake of their patients and how important it is for healthcare institutions and educational systems like ours to cultivate these new alliances and learn from this experience. During the talk, if you have questions for Dr. Nugis, please write them in the chat. You can find the chat at the bottom of your screen in the middle and by clicking on it, you'll be able to write or type a question. At the end of the talk, I will be addressing the questions that you write in the chat to Dr. Nugis. So please do stay until the end to hear your questions answered. Soyez à l'aise d'écrire des questions en français. Je vais les traduire pour le Dr. Nugus, alors il n'y a aucun problème, et en français et en anglais. So with that, I was very inspired by Mr. Brahman's um, logo or the, the slogan of the St. James Literary Society, Permite Luchem. And so we will now turn the floor over to Dr. Peter Nugus to shed some light for us on the emergency rooms in our province. Thank you very much, Dr. Dove, for your introduction. I'd also like to say thank you to my colleagues uh, from the Department of Family Medicine, uh, Dr. Isabel Vedel, Anik Baudry, and uh, Francesca Valenti for organizing this uh, presentation. Um, I'd also like to thank Dr. Yaffe for contextualizing the talk. Um, also, a sincere thank you to the, uh, to the uh, Rosenfeld family for supporting the, this series. And also, I'd like to thank um, Mr. Sam Brauman and the St. James Literary Society uh, for your ongoing commitment to exposure and public debate of topics in which we are all tremendously invested. Emergency rooms are, as Dr. Dove just pointed out, a hot topic uh, um, generally, and they're a hot topic in particular in the media and in research. They're highly visible and the gatekeeper of many health services. This has been exaggerated during the COVID-19 pandemic. Not only have lives been lost and overturned globally, but the pandemic has worsened the pressure on healthcare providers and in particular of late emergency rooms. But the considerable amount of attention on ERs is not new. Pressure on emergency rooms has been in the media for a number of years. So what is heroism and chaos in relation to an emergency? An emergency is a state of things unexpectedly arising and urgently demanding immediate action. This is, of course, a conventional and an unsurprising definition of an emergency. 
But if the ER is intended to be for emergencies and urgent situations, it raises questions about the role that an emergency room has in a health system and in society. A hero is a person noted for courageous acts of nobility of character. It's easy to see how a situation that requires urgent action lends itself to apparent heroism. Note here how the formal dictionary understanding or denotation mixes courageous acts with a comment about the inherent character. The emphasis here is on the essential nobility of character, more so than an emphasis I'll adopt in this presentation, that of a regular person, the effects of whose actions are noble. A situational setting that requires urgent or immediate action could also create the impression of chaos, which is defined as a total lack of organization or order. This also aligns with the conventional understanding of the term. However, the way chaos or chaos theory is understood in physics and some other natural sciences gives us a little bit more breathing space. Uh, being defined as the appearance of disorder among random phenomena that belies its actual underlying order. In terms of language in this presentation, I'm going to switch between ER and ED. There's, a, there's an ongoing interesting debate about the terminology of emergency departments. Some people believe that it's disrespectful to call an emergency room a room rather than a department, especially given the enormous growth of emergency medicine and the explosion of emergency departments in the last 40 years, having achieved the status in some countries of having its own college and its own, own training program. So I'll move between the two, ED, ER, um, and probably leaning more towards ER since it's, since it's, it's more familiar. Uh, EM will denote emergency medicine. I'll also use the word clinician to refer not only to doctors, but to all healthcare professionals. Having said that, although I'll refer to different healthcare professionals, I'll focus more on doctors because they are the primary decision makers in regard to patient pathways through the ER and other services. I'd like to share a couple of words from a gent named Dr. Peter Rosen, a founding father of emergency medicine and who passed away late last year who would be familiar to many emergency doctors because he's the author of the famous Rosen's Emergency Medicine, now in its 10th edition. It's a rather le lengthy excerpt, uh, but uh, from an interview, uh, but I think it covers a lot of good ground in terms of what makes emergency medicine unique and tells us something of how the history of emergency departments relates to their current context. Many of our enemies said there was nothing unique about emergency medicine, which actually was the source of some of my discontent. In 1979, I wrote a paper called The Biology of Emergency Medicine, probably the best paper I ever wrote, because the Dean of the University of Chicago told me that when he had his heart attack, he wanted a cardiologist to take care of him and not an emergency physician. I asked him how he knew he was having a heart attack. He looked puzzled. I said, we can't have 47 different specialists sitting there waiting for a patient who knows what's wrong with himself to come in and ask for one of them. Someone has to screen the field, which means deciding who's the sickest and who, ha and, and who has what problem that needs intervention. Also, it's a different process. Our job as emergency clinicians is to find out first if the patient's dying and then get them back on the road to health. Then and only then do you start worrying about diagnosis. One of the two most memorable patients of my career was a 42-year-old man who came in complaining of shoulder pain. He'd had an acute onset of it as he awakened that morning. When I examined him, he had a clear rotator cuff tear. I x-rayed him, couldn't find anything. I was about to sling him and send him to ortho for follow-up when I finally asked the right question, which was, how does a 42-year-old man get a rotator cuff tear in his sleep? I went and said, did you bite your cheek last night? He said, yes, how did you know? I said, did you wet your bed last night? He looked terrified because he wasn't going to tell me that. He lived alone and was very ashamed of it. 
I ordered a head CT and he had a meningioma and he'd had a seizure, of course, the night before. That case has stayed with me for many years because it is the classic definition of emergency medicine and why diagnosis isn't enough. You have to understand that part of your job is, why did the patient develop this disease today? What's different about the patient? That's what I have to intervene in. Another way of asking tonight's question is, is the functioning of an ER a question of heroism or managing chaos? The media, as I alluded to earlier, provides stories that may make it appear that we need heroes to manage the chaos. And in some form or another, it's usually overcrowding uh, and consequent lengthy wait times that attract media and popular attention to ERs. Research has shown that ER overcrowding, long wait times and increasing numbers of ER visits are faced by many countries. An important driver for increasing growth rates are patients who could have safely been treated by a primary care provider. Primary care services are often less accessible and poorly coordinated with the ER as the link to the rest of the hospital. And the lack of a family doctor is a strong predictor of emergency department visits, especially among seniors and vulnerable people. In Canada, emergency room utilization and wait times are considerably higher than in other industrialized countries, including the US. Historically, Quebec policy has strongly incentivized patients to use the ER rather than primary care facilities. In the Netherlands, by contrast, while patients do not have to pay for visiting acute primary care clinics, and I'm not advocating here a user pay system, they do have to pay for visits to the ER up to their deductible insurance rate. As in many European countries, Dutch primary care physicians have a direct gatekeeping role towards secondary or tertiary care. What are the key messages for tonight? The heroism of emergency clinicians that people see on the TV is based on a mis misguided view of the virtuous, knowledgeable individual. Emergency clinicians are called also to be heroes of logistics, communication, and organizational knowledge and skills. Healthcare policymakers and educators talk about systems and networks and the like, but we do not walk the talk. Sociology is a discipline, an area of study which focuses on the relations between people. A sociological lens focuses on people's interdependence with each other. So what would warrant a sociological view on the way healthcare is delivered in an ER or in any other health service for that matter? Let's start with medical error. Medical errors are the third leading cause of death in the United States. It's even got its own name, iatrogenic illness. But the research has shown that most, between 60 and 80% of medical errors are not caused by clinical interventions alone. Most errors are caused by communication or coordination issues. This obviously puts a premium on understanding coordination issues in healthcare and using appropriate theories and methods. It's time for another story. And it's a story about George. George is an EEM resident calling a cardiology resident. Yes, I know it's a renal problem, but she's your patient. I know, I know, yes, but I know. And I've noted in my notes here, red face, livid. Look, she's had, no, you guys, but the medication you gave her destroyed her kidneys and now she's back in hospital. Listen, we need to stop the medication you're giving her. No, because her kidney was fine. She didn't have chronic kidney failure. She had normal kidneys that are being poisoned by your medication. Oh, whatever. Slams down the phone, says to the researcher, I wish they had one of those screens attached to the phone so he could see my size. Little smart ass. It's interesting because this was a real life telephone conversation. It also really resonates with a book which after 40 years is still popular with clinicians, Samuel Shem's House of God, written in 1978. The House of God is a hospital. 
The book is intended to be humorous, but resonant at the same time with clinical work, especially in the ER. In the following excerpt from House of God, a senior resident is advising a first year resident called an intern or a turn about how to avoid accepting patients in their service. Specifically, his advice is about the treatment of older people who frequently present to the ER with uninspiring but complicated symptoms, but whose condition is incurable. Such patients are disparagingly called GOMAs, which stands for get out of my emergency room. Since GOMAs don't die, the turn had to find other ways to turf them. The problem with the turf was that the patient might bounce, that is, get turfed back, because you've got to always remember, you're not the only one trying to turf. Every turn and resident in the house of God is lying awake at night thinking how to buff and turf these gomas somewhere else. That doctor's so scared of missing something by sending the patient back home, he admits them all. He's a sieve. He lets everyone through. Be a wall. Don't let anyone in. I suggest that the importance of managing inevitable hospital politics is as important in 2020 as it was in 1978. So I'll start by telling you about my journey as a sociologist and ethnographer. My journey as a sociologist of health and illness has involved looking beyond the biomedical aspects of care. I have applied a sociological focus to investigating interprofessional learning and collaborational organizational restructuring, the policy practice interface, formal and informal regulation of care quality, cultures of innovation, work-based learning, and the development of academic and research skills in settings as diverse as emergency departments, primary care, aged care, oncology, mental health care, and indigenous health care, often using participatory research methods. My undergraduate degree was a combined degree in political science and philosophy. While working in different fields, mainly educational, I studied for a research master's in political sociology and a master's in adult education externally and by distance. I came back to full-time internal study on a scholarship to undertake a PhD in medical sociology. I believed that sociology was better at explaining interconnections than political science. It was for my PhD research that I initially investigated emergency departments. As a non-healthcare professional investigating emergency departments, I was initially fascinated by the idea of understanding trauma communication. As an observer, this seemed the most exciting focus, but following the rules of ethnographic observation, I spent many months just hanging around the ED, trying to understand who did what and what the rhymes and rhythms and routines of the place were. It was then that I felt that the real excitement was understanding the coordination that happens in emergency department. That is the communication and negotiation that happens between emergency clinicians and clinicians from hospital specialty departments, such as those from what I call organ specific teams like cardiology, neurology, orthopedic surgery, etc. For example, it was fascinating for a non-clinician to, to hear the same patient presenting with shortness of breath being described somewhat differently to respiratory, cardiology and renal teams. This shouldn't have been surprising to me. From my base in political science, I found organisational bargaining fascinating. But in particular, I was interested in politics as a positive concept, not politics as we understand it, that is, as something underhanded and dirty, but the way Aristotle understood it. Aristotle believed that politics was the business of doing the good of the community, doing the public business. This is related too to the way Aristotle understood morality in terms of how we treat one another. It's a perspective that's hard to understand now that our idea of morality is so tightly shaped by organized religion. But Aristotle placed less emphasis on whether people were inherently good or bad. They learn to be moral through interaction with other people. Foreshadowing social psychology and sociology of the early 20th century, people's behavior is not just driven by what they decide in their heads as individuals, but by what other people expect of them in an interconnected system of roles and expectations. 
It was this emphasis on collectivity that also took me to sociology. So my focus has been on understanding coordination processes in relation to the ED. If 60 to 80% of errors come from coordination processes, then biomedical work is inherently bound up with working with other people. It's not an added extra. In essence, the discipline of sociology is about understanding how people influence each other. Now, sociology, as one of the social science disciplines, is focused on how the individual is influenced by groups and society, and how the individual in turn influences the groups they belong to and their wider society. Part of that system of roles and expectations is something we learn from others by being in that system. That's why clinical rotations by medical students and first year residents can be so difficult or even traumatic. There's a new set of rules to learn. When we learn the rules, we no longer mention them explicitly. They're implicit or tacit. We don't need to mention the rules explicitly because the person we're talking to is part of that system. They already know the rules. This set of rules is also called a culture and we all belong to many overlapping cultures. There's a culture of Notre Dame Hospital and there's a culture of St. Mary's Hospital. Um, there's a worldwide culture of nursing um, and even of emergency nursing that transcends geographical boundaries. A way to understand a culture or cultures is to do ethnography. Ethnography is about the in-depth understanding of cultures. A central question is, what are the hidden meanings that unite this group? Ethnography is a set of methods, which includes observation, interviewing, document analysis, and even quantitative research sometimes where appropriate, that is intended to guide the researcher to an in-depth understanding of a culture. It comes originally from the discipline of anthropology. What distinguish it from other methodologies, especially qualitative methodologies, um, is observation in real live interactions of people in their natural environment, such as doing everyday clinical work and care in the emergency department. Ultimately, the ethnographer needs to find patterns in the culture that are relevant in this setting and other similar settings. The challenge for the ethnographer is, as I said before, that people don't talk about their culture explicitly, they just do it. They don't need to talk about it. The ethnographer has to spend a long time listening, watching, asking, doubting, comparing, so that they put themselves with the right people at the right times and places to document hints of the culture and put the pieces together in a way that's plausible and that is generalizable enough, for want of a better word, to be relevant to other people outside of the particular people or institutions that they are observing. The research that I'll talk about this evening was done in Canada, Australia, the Netherlands, the US and Argentina. A particular focused comparative study was conducted across Australia, the Netherlands and the US. This talk is based on more than 3000 hours of observation internationally. It's also based on policy analysis and extensive formal and informal interviewing. The transcripts and field notes were analysed using thematic analysis through a detailed search for varied potential explanations for particular events and actions to arrive at the central concepts, some of which I'm presenting this evening. Like doctors, ethnographers take many notes. Probably less than 1% of an ethnographer's notes end up in public, that is in a paper or a book. You don't know what you're going to find, so you work from the bottom up. And here's a sample. Here's an excerpt I like. It's an interview with a first year resident whom I shadowed over a couple of shifts. No, and thank you too. People always asked me who was following me. It made me feel important. And it's funny, the other day I was thinking of you following me, you weren't, but it was weird because I was wondering what you would have thought or what I would have done differently if you were there. It's not like I'd necessarily act differently or even like I thought you were judging me or anything but I think it's made me think more about how I do things. There's a therapeutic aspect to being observed and the companionship of sorts. I like this quote 
because I think it's much more than the common view of teaching individuals to be reflective. And it's not because it's me or anyone in particular that's observing them, but it focuses on that sense of being an audience or being critical unto oneself. It implies some of the collaborative awareness that is the starting point of questioning how we do things. Questioning the institutions or systems that we are a part of, questioning the role of health systems and medical care in society. The attention that EDs get in the media, especially under COVID-19 conditions, relates to who is an ideal user of this scarce resource. The question is exacerbated in the United States, which has a relatively weak primary care system. And this is what a first year emergency resident from the United States had to say. There's a lot more primary care because patients have no insurance or they're even illegal immigrants. Like today, someone had abdominal pain for three years and came in today because they got a ride to the hospital. They've got no primary care. It's not their fault. They've got nowhere else to go. Here, a fifth year EM resident, again from the United States, is responding to a first year EM complaining that a particular patient is not urgent. The fifth year resident says, patients aren't psychic and they're not doctors. That's why they're here. This quote echoes Peter Rosen's thoughts earlier about the importance of emergency medicine and hence the emergency department about finding out what is wrong with the patient and what, if anything, needs to be done immediately. What is more, in everyday work and clinical care, this culture is being imparted, not explicitly, but implicitly. Neither of these two interlocutors might be aware that there's a particular culture being imparted. This culture is reproduced through medical education and increasingly through what's known as work-based learning. Now, the following excerpt is a joke. And it's a joke which represents the story of the interplay between specialties. And what is that interplay? Every specialty and department has its role in the hospital. To do that, they form their own cultures, which often clash in the ED. This is not a bad thing. Consider the following joke. There's a gastroenterology resident and a cardiology resident in the ED. The gastro resident says, they're a cardiology case. The cardiologist says, no man, it's gastro, but good try. The gastroenterologist said, all right then, if that's your attitude, I'll stop his medication, give him chest pain and give him back to you. Raucous laughter, backstaps, black slaps and everybody leaves. Taking a peek behind the curtain, jokes can really tell us a lot about a culture. Would this actually have happened? No. If they would have really wanted to do this, they would not have said it out loud and laughed about it. We have the privilege of, of witnessing here clinical cultures in the making. Indeed, if we listen to Aristotle and also take a sociological approach, we don't necessarily see this as devious, that is against the patient interest. It's not about good and bad individuals, but about systems that promote particular cultures and the roles people are encouraged to play within those cultures. Indeed, anthropological research has shown that the development of strong clinical cultures, even within particular specialties or, or professions, is important to allow learners, like residents and medical students, to make mistakes safely. Here we have a Canadian emergency physician balancing interdepartmental relationships. We as emergency clinicians won't just send someone up to the hallway of the ward. It just doesn't happen. We could send a patient up, but we never do because they could retaliate later. We're all colleagues and we all work together. We're going to presumably most of us stay here continuing to work together for years forward. So yeah, you want to have a reputation with your colleagues that is collegial. You want them to like you and you want to like them. So ideally you don't have any sort of bad blood. You'll never win, so do your best and chill out. What does this tell us? This is not a competition between good and bad. It's simply the way things are. There's a tension in the ED between acting collaboratively with other specialties and the need to push the patient out of the ED. After all, 
The main function of EDs is to discharge patients. Another emergency physician from Canada elaborated on patient transfers with other departments. The problem is that there are bed shortages all over. Sometimes the patient doesn't fit into the right slot. So, the discussion, so then discussion often ensues and the beds are usually full upstairs. And each service has its priorities in terms of who they consider most appropriate for their given domain. General hospital specialty teams will take the patient if appropriate. Consider an 85 year old patient who's clearly declining cognitively and has social problems, but doesn't really have active medical issues, yet she cannot go home. So she needs to be admitted to the hospital. Theoretically, internal medicine would not consider admitting her, I wouldn't think. If I was internal medicine, I wouldn't admit a patient if there was not a particular medical issue. Because they deal with complex and multiple medical conditions, internal medicine tends to become the default admitting service. So emergency department clinical work is inherently interdepartmental and interorganizational work, and it's complex work. There are competing medical cultures for which the ED is a crucible. The classic challenge has always been how to refer. The challenge is now with increased complexity as a result of increased aging and chronic disease and other issues is an intensification of the challenge of patient transfer. In the Netherlands, like in much of Western Europe, where there is a strong primary care system, but no formal emergency medicine specialty, college of emergency medicine or EM training program, the EDs are usually run either by internal medicine or general surgery. Here, a Dutch emergency department nursing team coordinator complains that hospital specialty departments have too much power over the ED and they use the ED as an overflow department and where their older outpatients can get easy access to clinical tests. The nursing team coordinator says, I started a discussion with surgery to tell them that the ED was not a dumping ground for their outpatient department. Here's a conversation between an emergency physician and a first year emergency resident. The emergency physician says, he'll have cardiology input. The after hours medical resident and the cardiologist will say, he's 82, aged care. We need to know his social situation. The first year resident says, he does exercises and lives with his wife with a rising inflection like a question. The emergency physician gives positive feedback, sounding good, that'll deflect him from aged care. Try cardiology. Implicitly, that is without the cultural rules being made explicit, what's happening here is that the first year resident is being taught important organizational knowledge and skills to ensure that the patient finds a bed in the hospital. Talking about older people again, this time we have a conversation between a fifth year emergency resident, the ED nursing team coordinator and a first year emergency resident. The fifth year emergency resident asks the first year resident, what's her age? The first year resident replies, 72. How old does she have to be to go to Jerry's? And looks it up in a booklet. The ED nursing team coordinator says, it's a bit soft, you might can sell them. The fifth year resident says, gastro would be even better. Since we're talking about work as learning and emergency clinical work being about a learning journey towards learning the culture of organizational work, the ethnographer bears witness to such learning in live interaction. As I mentioned earlier, this is what we call work-based learning. Negotiations based on the need to transfer patients to sometimes unwilling hospital departments may look chaotic. However, the bargaining across departments is one way of ensuring that each unique department or specialty can fulfill its function in the overall system of the hospital. Remember that in physics, behavior that is unpredictable may only appear to be random. A geriatric medicine resident said in an interview, we had to have a meeting with the ED. We had to say, the average age of admission of patients in this hospital is 80. So don't ring us and say, oh, this woman's 85, so she's yours. The point is that 
the geriatric medicine department needs the patient to have a specifically geriatric issue. In other words, their presenting condition must medically reflect inherent frailty. Increasing complexity with aging has affected the dynamic between discharge and referral. This is reflected in an intensification of the relationship between the ED and hospital specialties. Here's an account from the perspective of hospital specialty medicine. In an interview, the hospital specialty doctor says, it's a long way to come to the ED and I've got patients everywhere. We're overloaded. I mean, I'm a human being, I need stimulus. We're just so overloaded and short of time. What are you going to do? An older person with a heart problem? You try not to come down unless you're convinced there's a good chance it's one of, your, one of ours. A young person with a heart problem? Now that's interesting. I'm just being honest. In the phone call with George that we encountered earlier, did that sort of interaction happen every day? Possibly not. But consistent with my observations in EDs in many other countries, this type of organisational bargaining and patient passing was a pattern. But ensuring that the patient is relevant for admission in a resource-constrained environment, who's to say that such an approach is not patient-centred? I find this quote illuminating because the hospital specialty resident I interviewed gives a hospital specialty departmental perspective directly and in terms of coordination. Selling is the proper way, not demanding. The burden of proof is on emergency. They have to prove that the patient is worthy of your care. They have to buff the patient to make it look good. You must target the selling to the specialty. Tests take time, but they give evidence. All things being equal, an organ-specific specialty department like cardiology or orthopedic surgery has more power in the hospital than emergency medicine. They know more about their particular organ system than an EM doctor and as such can really decide if, how and when particular patients are admitted to their service. In response to the organ-specific power of the hospital specialty departments, emergency clinicians learn to exercise deep organisational knowledge and skills to progress patient pathways. This includes learning how to sell patients. This is part of the necessary culture of the ED. And here's what this looks like from an ED nursing team coordinator's perspective. They're talking to, to the nurse manager of another unit. The ED nursing team coordinator says, hi, it's Jennifer here from emergency. I need you to take a patient post-operatively. They're going to surgery. Don't worry, you probably won't get him on your shift. Organizational skills include conveying empathy to colleagues from other departments, which stems from being able to imagine not inherent roles, perspectives, positions or morality, but being able to imagine the other person or department situation as one that they too could find themselves in under other circumstances. This is an example of the order in the seeming disorder of the flow of patients in the hospital. This can also manifest as assertiveness. In this case, the ward does not want to take an emergency department patient. So the ED nursing team coordinator says firmly to the discharge planning unit officer, I think we'll have to say no. You'll have to put pressure on the ward. You know, 4.30, 5 o'clock and they're here for the night. An emergency physician said in an interview, first and second year residents have almost been trained out of diagnosis. You only get good at driving a car by driving a car. You have to learn to be a doctor. You have to make a teaching point out of the diagnosis. You've got to get them to think at work and be professional. Some of the most serious illnesses are pretty easy. I have the protocol, the flowchart imprinted in my head. Our job is to exclude the nasties. We teach juniors those nasties to get the hierarchy of things that can kill you. The residents today knew what they were doing, but they've got to learn how it all fits together. So learning must include the ability to understand and be able to create changing systems of which the residents are a part. 
Here, a first-year emergency medicine resident is about to call the after-hours medical resident to seek inpatient for a patient to a medical ward. The supervising physician is standing right behind her. So the first-year resident says to the researcher, I'll ring the after-hours medical resident. Hi, it's Trudy here from emergency. I have a patient that needs admitting. He's got a history of acute appendicitis. Now, the emergency physician standing behind looks exasperated. So this was surprising to me as a non-clinical observer because I didn't know why they were exasperated, but I obviously made a note to say, must follow up. And then she said, okay, bye. I still remember the emergency physician folding his arms and asking, what did he say? The first year resident said, he said, call the surgery resident. The physician said, of course he did. You don't tell him he's got a history of appendicitis. It's an easy bounce straight to surgery. So what's happening here? Clearly, the resident is being told implicitly that to join the ED culture, they need to learn how to manage information to maintain the plausible functioning of the ED. Is maximizing and minimizing certain aspects of a case poor professionalism? From the point of view of inherent morality, possibly. However, a sociological perspective also recognizes the fact that the resident is being taught implicit organizational knowledge and skills. A more familiar phrase for this is the hidden curriculum, but with a more positive interpretation as a twist. So on the assumption that clinical and organizational work are inseparable, the resident here is learning to use organizational knowledge and skills for optimal patient care. The making of an emergency medicine doctor is a seemingly chaotic interplay of the explicit and hidden curricula. This quote, which is my final excerpt of data, illustrates that clinical information alone is not sufficient to understand how to work in an ED. Clinical information needs to be contextualized. The emergency physician says to a medical student, okay, James, you've got lovely writing, but how do you go from being a student to a doctor? Pretend we're on a medical round. Tell me in one sentence, that should be your impression, you know, the overall clinical picture and what's going, what should happen and where the patient's going to go. And the EM physician, uh, the, the student gives the EM physician um, their impression. The physician says, aha, uh -huh. is that all? And then they ask increasingly specific clinical questions and then asks, do they? If you don't know, say so. The student says, I don't know. The physician says, I don't know either. Your notes are fantastic, but you must give the impression. This quote identifies a teaching moment where the initiate, the initiate is invited to calibrate their language to the shared expectations of the culture. So is the functioning of the ED a question of heroism or managing chaos? The functioning of the ED the fun is about creating and maintaining a system of explicit and, and implicit rules for relationship management to facilitate its role of patient categorization and transfer for the health system and for society. Within that culture is the relationship between seniors and juniors that is simultaneously about work, about work supervision and also about training. Emergency department work is about the future. It's future directed. The emphasis is on flow through the department. You could say that emergency medicine is the current care of future patients. It's about moving patients through to make room for future patients. This continual carousel-like motion makes ED work inherently interdepartmental work. And that is whether it's to pursue admission or sometimes to seek a specialty consultation just to confirm discharge. Terms that are similar to the House of God had resonance among the emergency clinicians in the research that I've conducted. And this includes adrenaline nursing up there, down here, etc. The inseparability 
of clinical and organizational work in the ED means that it could be characterized as clinical organizational work. My extensive research across a number of different countries has delivered a number of findings. Principal, principal among these are the following. Emergency clinicians and clinicians from other departments have competing organizational perspectives. For the emergency department, the prevailing question is a holistic question of does this patient need to come into the hospital or can they be discharged? However, for inpatient hospital specialty, especially organ specific departments, the question is of a more organ specific nature. If this patient needs to come into hospital, must they come in under our department or should they be coming in under another department? The relationship with other departments partly depends on the strength of the primary care system. There's also an association between the strength of a primary care system and the relative power of emergency departments in the hospital. For example, US hospitals are more likely to admit patients directly and Dutch emergency departments are more likely to be disempowered. More generalist specialties like geriatric medicine and internal medicine are more in demand than organ specific specialties like cardiology and gastroenterology. I do realize that it's a bit different in some Canadian departments that have internal medicine doctors rostered in the ED. In response to organizational pressures, emergency clinicians learn the politics of patient transfer, how to package the patient into an organizationally relevant category and sell them to others. These are important skills when managing patient flow and preventing ER overcrowding, not only during extreme times, like now with the COVID-19 pandemic, but also when we go back to the pre-pandemic status quo with already overcrowded emergency departments. So what does all of this mean? The success of emergency rooms depends on strong support for frontline primary care and also for primary care research that underpins primary care practice. The strong link between primary care and emergency department visits suggests that aligned investments to improve primary care, especially for seniors and vulnerable populations, will help, help ensure appropriate use of emergency departments. Increasing availability of urgent primary care facilities, um, including out of, out of hours primary care facilities, is important in addition to improving coordination between urgent primary care and the emergency department. There are lessons from the adaptation to COVID-19. A dramatic one is the massive resident redeployment that has happened at the MUHC. And the lessons from such adaptation need to inform future routine care. We talk systems, networks, communities of practice, and more recently, syndemics and learning healthcare systems. We need to walk the talk in clinical policy and in education. We need to adopt and apply biosocial models that account for complex interrelationships between socioeconomic status and biological conditions. Even in developed countries, poverty is still the principal cause of illness. We need to defend public health care, even when there are small components of, of private provision of healthcare in there and openly and critically debate the balance between societal expectations and sustainable healthcare. And this will be an increasing challenge because we need to increasingly meet the needs of an aging population, those with chronic disease, disability, mental health crises, and the needs of other vulnerable communities. We need to foster a work-based learning perspective, which includes participatory research and patient partnerships in research, policy and practice. The reproduction of medicine through medical education must include the hidden curriculum consisting of communication, interprofessionalism, collaboration, critical thinking skills, and adaptability to shifting institutional contexts, health systems, and societies. 
the implicit promotion in medical education of the idea of the hero as is conventionally understood or the heroic doctor who is morally virtuous and has read all the biomedical textbooks and, and papers possible is a danger to patients and the society that pays for healthcare systems and that pays for their medical education. One of the CANMED's roles that's promoted and assessed by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada is that of advocacy. This means that it's been identified by the Royal College as an important quality and skill of medical practice. To be able to advocate for patients and be change agents, medical students need to learn to be able to reflect collaboratively and critically on healthcare systems and the role of healthcare systems in society. The current model of medical education is how I see, is how I, the current model here is how I see medical education at the moment. The real stuff, the real essence of medical education and medical practice is seen to be biomedical or bioclinical knowledge and natural or bench scientific knowledge. Social scientific knowledge, on the other hand, is relegated to fluff on the side. This fuzzy people stuff is an added extra. In a medical setting, social science is sometimes seen as telling fairy tales. But whatever heroism there is needs to involve training our future healthcare professionals to develop the phenomenal quality of mastering a tremendous set of skills that are both obvious and less obvious, but equally important in modern medicine. The prevailing attitude in medical education is this stuff is nice, but let me get to it later. Maybe I don't even need it because I'm a good person. We need a more holistic model of medical education, which inherently includes social scientific knowledge. Of course, in recent years, there has been an increased focus on human aspects like healthcare, professional patient communication, teamwork skills, reflection, and self-care or resilience, but we can go one step further. Without fully integrating an empirical base of social scientific knowledge, the application of non-biological aspects of care become accidental or something at the women fancy of individual doctors or medical educators. There is an empirical base to sociology and other social sciences like anthropology, psychology, and linguistics. In order to meet today's societal challenges, a holistic model, a genuinely systemic perspective on bioscientific and social scientific knowledge is important. Such an integrated model would allow for interventions into that system to foster interprofessional care and better collaboration generally, and given statistics presented earlier about error, safer and more personalized and more effective care. Excluding social science from the model of medical education pushes us into a corner where the only intervention we're left with is to say, be nice to patients. It's a unidimensional perspective in the complex world we live in today. What do we need to do instead? The desired model is an integrated model. This is a model in which we see biomedical or natural scientific knowledge and social scientific knowledge of which there is an empirical basis in research as equal foundations of medical practice. They should both be embedded formally in medical curricula. Finally, let's give future healthcare professionals the tools and motivation they need to be sustainable heroes of the broad concept of health. Combining biomedical knowledge with organisational knowledge and skills will save lives and improve the future health of Canadians. Thank you very much, Peter. Dr. Nugis, Professor Nugis, that was very interesting and I would like to remind all of the audience that you can put 
questions into the chat that you can write questions. We have a hand up from Alex Simonellis. So Alex, if you would like to go ahead with your question, you can say it verbally if you like. I'm not sure if that might be an error. So maybe we will go to a written question in the chat. So uh, Professor Nugis, there's a question from Isabelle Vedel saying, thanks Peter for this excellent talk. What is the relationship with the referring family physician? Is there any way that ER physicians mm -hmm. uh, send back the patient or sell back the patient to primary care? Well, I think that there, there could and, and maybe, in, uh, maybe instances in where this happens. And I, I'm not 100% sure I understand the question, but I think that um, the challenge has been, um, especially in the Quebec setting, that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, historical policy has kind of disincentivized people, not only from, uh, from attending primary care, uh, primary care practitioners and facilities have, especially in recent times, uh, tried to become more integrated into the health system and more interprofessional. Um, unfortunately, until recent times, um, in spite of uh, government policies, but there have been you know, concerted efforts by policymakers and the Quebec government in recent years to try and structure that into, um, into um, GMFs and GMFUs and also um, CLSCs. Um, well, one example, just to give you an idea of how, how difficult it was, was that um, you know, after deinstitutionalization in the 1970s of um, mental health facilities, there were a lot of um, mental health patients who flooded the emergency department. Um, also, um, the government um, mandated that 10% of beds would be reserved in the hospital for long-term care patients. That obviously blew out. And, um, and then they gave um, you know, emergency departments priority over placement for long-term care facilities. So the irony is that there was a kind of a structure in place and, of course, what we might call a culture where, ironically, the emergency department also became the entry to long-term care facilities. So I think that... Um, that you know, it's a, it's it's part of something that needs to be able to be taught. But I think, in terms of you know, medical education, for example, and for that matter, education of other healthcare pro professionals, healthcare systems are very complex, and there's a lot of different players, as we all know. There's governments, there's unions, there's different occupations, there's um, private providers, and of course, there are patients and citizens. And um, it's um, it's unavoidably complex, and we're asking complex, often by bio, increasingly bioethical questions. So I think a lot of this stems from not only the fact of teaching patients how they might, um, you know, improve the the coordination and the links with primary care, but actually in teaching, it might even involve teaching them, as does happen today, um, to a more or less degree at different medical schools, um, of actually how the system works. Thank you, Professor Nugis, for that answer. So it seems the chat was maybe disabled for a while, but it's now available if people want to write a question. They have to go to the bottom of their screen and click on chat, and then you can write your question. Or at the bottom of your screen, there's a place to raise your hand if you click on reaction, and you can raise your hand, and I will call on you. And so while we're waiting for some questions to come in, Peter, um, I'm going to ask you one myself based on my own experience. So I was very interested in your uh, very first vignette about the uh, person who wanted a cardiologist to be treating them in the emergency room if they had a heart problem. They somehow assumed that that would be the best care. And you talked about patients self-diagnosing. Um, and you pointed out very rightly that this is extremely dangerous. Not that patients don't know what's wrong with them, they do know what's wrong with them. And one thing that we are taught in medical school is to talk to your patients because they will tell you what is wrong with them, but they might not have the medical knowledge to put it all together. So I remember when I was a medical student in an emergency room in Montreal, I won't tell you which one in case it gives people a, uh, a bad impression of that emergency room, but this woman came in 
clutching her chest and telling me she was having a panic attack. She said she was known for panic attacks and she was having a terrible panic attack. And so as a young medical student, I was very empathetic and I was talking to her about the reasons for her panic attack and how her husband was leaving her and so on. And meanwhile, she had an electrocardiogram which showed that she was having an acute myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack. So this is just to show that sometimes people think that they know what's wrong with them, but they might know what their symptoms are, but they might not actually know the diagnosis. So just to say, I completely agree with your um, points that you're making at the beginning of your talk. Well, thank you, Dr. Dove. And it's a very interesting point you raise. Um, um, and, and I'm kind of sitting here imagining you as a medical student uh, uh, and, and how challenging it must have been to, to balance all those, those factors. And, um, and I think it's interesting with emergency medicine or, or any type of you know, clinical problem solving, and it's caused a, a lot of um, perhaps tension and soul searching in the emergency medicine, medicine community in the sense that um, on, on the one hand, it's about you know, um, urgent care, doing something immediately, but it's also about um, you know, what, it, what is it that we want as an emergency college? And, and the, the books like, you know, Anyone, Anywhere, Anytime by Brian Zink, The History of Emergency Medicine. Um, the History of Emergency Medicine is described by Peter Rosen and Judith Tintinelli and others. Um, you know, really talk about being disrespected. And, and in the Netherlands now, they're trying to form their own, you know, emergency medicine college, which is different from a lot of um, other European um, European colleges. But, um, but you know, they, they, the risk is that they become a victim of their own success. And now inpatient departments kind of expect a very nice bow to be tied around the patient. So it's not only immediate, but it is diagnosis. So, so I think it's, it's very challenging, but I appreciate your, uh, your, your recollection. Thanks, Dr. Dove. There's a question now in the chat from Amalia Issa saying, thank you, Peter, for this excellent and fascinating talk. How do you see the organizing principles of the hidden curriculum influence clinical decision-making in terms of heuristics, biases, et cetera, and with respect to shared decision-making. This is very interesting in terms of decision-making and um, the decision-making literature has, has uh, understandably had a very, very cognitive bias. And I mean, it's very much been about um, tools and techniques and drawing on cognitive psychology to look at what it is that make people think. And different disciplines have different perspectives. And um, if I was to kind of draw a Venn diagram, um, you know, you have psychology overlapping with um, sociology. And of course, they all overlap with um, linguistics and other kind of disciplines. What makes psychology unique is that it make, mainly relates to um, what goes on in the head cognitively and how that influences behavior. A sociological perspective doesn't discount that. In, 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 in fact, it looks at a, what, what it would call um, an intersubjective view or a more integrated view between what's going on in the head because what's going on in the head is shaped by what's kind of expected of them. So I guess from a sociological point of view, and there's a lot of scope here to expand the way we understand dis decision-making actually interactively, not just as something we get right or wrong in our head first, and then we talk about it, but it's something that kind of comes back. And as, um, you know, emergency or all healthcare professionals know better than I do, um, you know, one situation is never like the next, you know, so they're, so it's, it's trying to combine the two. So I think there's a good um, scholarly conversation to continue to be had, to be applied in practice, to be tested and then to be refined. Thank you for that answer. And I think we have time maybe for one more question before we wrap up the evening. So there's a question from uh, Alex Simonellis saying, soft skills, um, shouldn't the soft skills be taken care of by one upper year course? The medical curriculum is chock full. So I wonder what you think about that. That's an excellent question. Um, real estate is very expensive in the medical curriculum. And um, I think what the message that um, that may be given is despite you know well-intentioned curriculum designers it's important to be very clear that the way the way these skills are integrated into the curriculum is sending the message that when you're making a medical decision um, whether it's about um, you know diagnosis or treatment 
there are non-biomedical factors that influence that decision. Of course, there's biological factors that are central, and that's, that's obviously the, the unique contribution of medicine to society to know that, and that's why we go to a doctor. Um, but there's also um, other non-biomedical uh, factors that, that play into that. So um, I think it's about integrating into the curriculum, not, not another block or unit or section, it's finding ways um, to integrate, what, integrate a more organizational perspective into what is already there. And this is very interesting because um, unless we're telling someone something explicitly, it's quite political and it's quite um, controversial in medical education because we, we have this kind of trend, especially in the um, in, in, in accreditation systems of medical schools, they're quite the models traditionally and the, the assumptions behind accreditation in some instances have been quite simplistic and that is the assumption that somebody knows what they need to know and a medical student knows what they need to know and so if you say it explicitly and teach it explicitly they might go oh that is that is okay but the I, I believe that one of the ways in which this could be taught within the integrated curriculum is actually to have them physically observing um, also documenting you know what happens with this experience and experimenting with what it might look like um, as, as a change process, but not just something on which they do, um, you know, a, a mere piece of reflection, but, um, but trying to integrate so social scientific knowledge with understanding a real life clinical setting, understanding a policy and trying to put it all together. And it's a very, it would be a very challenging process um, for medical students. Um, and the challenge might be that, you know, you haven't, they haven't been, um, uh, they haven't been persuaded that it's good for them. But my response to that would be, you might not think you need to know this, but um, the Quebec population, the Canadian population needs you to know this. And they're the ones that are paying for the healthcare system and paying for your medical education. Excellent points. Um, if I'm allowed, I'm gonna ask you the other questions in the chat, because I see we do have five minutes still. Um, so there's a question from Anik Gauthier saying, are you aware of Dr. Fuchs's work on the transparent curriculum in that the hidden curriculum is not hidden at all? Um, I, know, I know Dr. Fuchs's work to some degree, especially in terms of um, uh, humanities, medical humanities. I have heard that concept uh, before the transparent curriculum, whether it was Dr. Fuchs or somebody else who cited him, I'm not sure. Um, I've heard the idea. Um, I, I think there is, a, there is a big debate about saying, uh, you know, whether something should or should be kind of proceduralized. You know, um, some things, I mean, here there's, there's I mean, I, I don't exactly know what, uh, what you're talking about when you say it's not very hidden at all. I mean, I mean, to some degree, no, it's not hidden because, I mean, I, who's someone who's not even clinically trained, um, believe that I picked it up because I, I get told by emergency clinicians that I did. Um, so yeah, obviously there's some degree of openness about it. And let's be, let's be frank, if you're going to be influenced or work with another human being, you can never know what's in their head. The only thing you've got is, is what they say. So in, in being... In being transparent, it's, it's all about saying what is what is coming up in this situation, but also why what are where I would question that if it's if it's kind of being um, if it's kind of being presumed that it's entirely teachable um, in specifics as opposed to just the general concept that you need to be a social organizational kind of problem solver. Um, not a single situation is ever exactly the same, and I, I like um, I like the the sociological. Um, idea um, that Lipsky came up with in 1980, which is called street level bureaucracy. And it's kind of the idea that, um, that policy is really made at the front line in, in the specific situation. And in his book, he uses many wonderful examples like a policeman giving a, um, you know, deciding whether or not to give someone a speeding ticket, a social worker with a certain pot of money, you know, having to ration it, you know, who do I give it to? Um, and the magic word there is discretion. You know, it's actually made because it's that frontline actor who has that discretion. So I think it's that discretion that happens in that situation, but it's only through those kind of, not knowledge so much, but broader skills, the practice skills of collaborative critical 
thinking that puts someone in a position to be able to make such judgments on the front line. Thank you, Peter, for that interesting response and for the excellent talk overall. There are many comments in the chat about how interesting and uh, stimulating this talk was. So really, thank you very much on behalf of the Department of Family Medicine. And I would like to turn the floor over now to Professor Isabel Vedel, who will provide some closing remarks. So thank you very much, Peter Nugus, uh, Professor Nugus, for this uh, fascinating talk where we learn what is the hidden, uh, the, the um, hidden culture in the emergency department and the hidden curriculum. Um, and we really understand how it's much more than just treating, uh, diagnosing and treating a patient, how you manage the, the flow of uh, patient in emergency department. I would like also to thank Annick Baudry uh, for her dedication to the organization of uh, this event and coordination of this event. Uh, the research program uh, at the Department of Family Medicine for uh, the organization and the Department of Family Medicine, particularly uh, Dr. Marion Dove for her support and uh, Yasmin Elmir for making sure the events online format, format reach out uh, new ad audiences. Uh, I would like also to thank the St. James Literary Society for continued uh, collaboration towards bringing the lecture series uh, to the public every year. And uh, I'm sure this talk was absolutely excellent uh, for the public to understand what's going on in emergency department and it's not always uh, thought about. And a very special thank to uh, Mr. Samuel Bonman for his leadership in this uh, series. Uh, we, we love to work with uh, Samuel Bonman on this uh, uh, series. Uh, I would like also to thank Dr. Machiafe for giving us a lot of context about um, Hirsch Rosenfeld's uh, ambitious commitment to advance, advancing the understanding of what family medicine is all about uh, through a public lecture series. And a lot of thanks for all the participants. We had the uh, a record today of uh, you joining us for this event and uh, even if it's online and all the stimulating question you ask uh, thank you so much for your uh, participation so that is closing the the event so i think now we can go to our usual activities unless mayan would like to add something i have nothing else to add thank you isabel for those lovely words of thanks to everybody who has made this event so successful and thank you to all the participants that i saw uh, 122 people at one point this evening and it might have been even higher I wasn't following the whole time but a wonderful turnout and that's a big um, note of honor for you uh, Peter Nugus because uh, your talk certainly attracted a lot of people and uh, I thought it was absolutely fascinating very very interesting so thank you again to everyone and bonne nuit à tous à l'année prochaine <laughs>